St. Clement's Commons, which is behind these events, along with Henry Ruskin's Labour history. So, um, I, can, I can pretty much guarantee that this evening there are children whose parents are choosing, there are children in Cambridge whose parents are choosing between whether to feed them properly or clothe them properly because they can't do both. And those, those um, people in Cambridge are likely to live in that direction. And that means that they live in a, in a part of Cambridge where on average people uh, are likely to die 12 years earlier than people who live that way. So, you know, this is our city. It's one of the most unequal cities in um, England. Um, and there is surely something that we can do about this with all the kind of talent and goodwill and brains and technology and all the things that we have in Cambridge. There's surely something we can do about this, this, um, this terrible situation. So um, tonight's uh, uh, event is part of a series. Um, and the reason it's part of a series is because social inequality <coughs> isn't one thing. Social inequality <coughs> is about um, inequality of housing, uh, inequality of access to justice, inequality of health, you name it, a whole bunch of things. These are all different strands which together make a big knot of, of unfairness and waste in our society. So through these talks, we're asking domain experts for their, for their best advice on how to tackle that particular aspect of inequality. We hope to get a holistic picture from all of these. So please come to not just one talk, talk but to several, and you'll get this whole picture. Um, now, of course, today's International Women's Day. <laughs> so, um, although I said parents earlier, of course, the, the person who's looking after that child that I talked about, that, that unpaid carer, um, is most likely to be a woman. She's likely to be working class, and she's likely not to be white. And that's because, as we know, gender, class, and race uh, are three of these big fat strands in this knot of um, inequality. And that's why it's particularly exciting that we've got tonight Pfizer to talk to us about social mobility and class. And then the next talk is Ivy Vidal talking about um, the intersection of gender and um, <coughs> race. Sorry, <laughs> talking about the intersection of gender and race. And um, so, so this. This is a, basically feminism still stands accused of being too middle class and too white. So these two talks are really important <coughs> to the holistic analysis that we need to tackle this big knot of inequality. Um, okay, so that's the main intro. Just some basic admin. Any fire alarm that goes off is for real. We've got the exits here and a fire exit over there, and you assemble out on the road. Uh, the Wi-Fi uh, login is here and the hashtag, so please tweet. Anybody who wants to blog, please do blog and we'll publish it on our website. Um, we're recording the event, so when it comes to the questions, <coughs> however loud you think your voice is, please use the mic because then it gets onto our recording loop. Um, finally, I'll introduce our chair, David Howard. He was city councillor here for 17 years and MP for five. He's now Professor of Law and Public Policy at Cambridge University, and David will introduce Pfizer for us and share the discussion. Thank you. It's um, great to be back in our normal room um, and not having to shout at the top of our voice. Um, the speaker tonight is uh, Pfizer Shaheed. She's the Director of Class, uh, the Centre for Labour and Social Studies. She'll explain more about that later. But it does sound like one of those activisms where the activism came first. <laughs> um, <laughs> very good one. Um, prior to that, she was head of inequality and sustainable development at Save the Children UK. And before that, worked at the New Economics Foundation. And before that, another website doesn't say so. Uh, it said in cities, which is like, a very, very important uh, think tank. This, this was for me when I used to be in politics. Um, the class website uh, describes Pfizer as an economist, um, and we all know how we feel about economists. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, I note that um, her PhD uh, was in the geography of poverty, 
And I think that um, uh, is a good example of really she's not the time. She has a much broader uh, <coughs> scope uh, of thought and analysis than simply uh, economics. She's written about inequality. She's written about especially interactions of different types of inequality, on austerity, on migration, on youth unemployment, and on social mobility. And as Claire said, tonight she's going to talk about the interaction of two of those on class and social mobility. Fine. Just really quickly about class. So, yes, absolutely. We, uh, the name was decided not by me, actually, but it was essentially um, well, six years ago now, we just celebrated our fifth birthday in October, but um, a number of big unions came together, trade unions, and said um, we don't really have much space for the left um, to come together to think about policy ideas. So, from the left of the Labour Party to the trade union movement to activists and journalists. Um, sorts of people that are up here, um, where can we come together, think of ideas, and really force ourselves to move beyond the rhetoric and, and really root ourselves in, in those ideas, but root ourselves in the very lives of everyday working people. So it's a great honor to me to work at CLASS, and I have worked at several other different um, think tanks. The thing about CLASS that keeps me, keeps me rooted and real is that I constantly go out and speak to workers, some picket lines, um, do various different things and make sure that we're always listening and, and that we are, uh, the policies we look at, which inevitably end up being about austerity, wages and housing, more often than not, is because people are telling us that's what matters to them. But the other thing that constantly comes up, and I was just saying this to someone, is that before I started a class two years ago, is that we never really actually spoke about class so much, the issue of class. But since I started, I really love, I mean, part of the reason I wanted to be the director is because of the name class, because I'm obsessed with the issue, um, is how much this gets people going. Every time I write something on class, or we do something on class, and I'm not even really an expert on this, um, it's not what my PhD was on, but it just gets so much more attention than the hours of number country we might do on what's happening in the labour market. So hopefully, I know this sort of thing gets people going, um, and as does obviously the issue of social mobility. Just quickly on that, um, what is social mobility? It's going to drive me nuts. Um, <laughs> so easy way to do this. Yeah, you still. Yeah. Okay. I mean, oh, you, you, I thought I managed to get there. So obviously, the place to start, and I promise I'm not going to just moan uh, for most of this lecture. But it's so easy to do that at this, this current um, time. Um, but I do need to lay out where we are on the whole discussion of social mobility. Of course, to think about where we can go further. Um, and the first thing I always like to do is, is to like Google images of things because I think sometimes I could do a sense of what is like popular about and what is understood about these subjects. Um, and obviously, the first thing that comes up about social mobility at art is this idea of ladders and climbing ladders. Um, and again, this I think this is, is a very emotive issue. I mean, there's so much, uh, so much of what we understand of doing well in life that is to move up a ladder is to get more status, to get a better job, to get more money. Um, and not just for ourselves in our own lives, um, but for our children. And that in particular is something that people hold very, very dear. And my mother, she called me Faiza Shaheen. Um, Shaheen isn't my original surname. Faiza Shaheen. Faiza means that I am a winner. And Shaheen means I'm a bird that flies high. <laughs> and, you know, for her as an immigrant from Pakistan, she... It was built into her very essence that her children had to do better than she did. That coming here, leaving her family behind, and the emotional loss that caused her, you know, had to mean something. And that meaning something was her children doing better. And so it is a very emotional subject, right? So many of us have those stories of our own, our own journey, or our, or our grandparents' journey, or our parents' journey, which is about essentially some idea of moving from something to something and having a better life. Um, and so when I first started off many years ago, you know, on my own journey of social mobility, which was growing up in East London and going to Oxford, I was really into the idea of social mobility and, and into the idea of how we can make it happen more. And over the last, giving away my age, the last 15 years of studying it and, and 
living there and being in so many different types of rooms where, you know, essentially so many people went to private school and uh, are protecting a particular type of economic system, I've realised that it's a farce, that the best thing we can do with the idea of social mobility as it's currently framed is to throw it in the bin, is to start a whole new conversation. So let me talk to you a bit about you know, what I found along that journey and then to talk about how we do start a new conversation on that. Um, and so that this is kind of in your own lifetime. Um, yeah, the next one. <laughs> yeah, that might be. <laughs> and this is like another image that comes up that's quite typical, right? It's these like, and I think this is really important here to understand these sort of small steps to getting a bit more money you know, at the top of the chain, and, and you know that's essentially how people see it. But in reality, it's like, um, you know, it's more like massive, massive jumps. And then here's the one percent with an insane amount of money that doesn't even often fit on the graph. You have to change the axis of the graph. And, um, you know, what does social mobility mean when those steps are so huge? When we've had a situation from the late 70s when the top 1% had 6% of our wealth to now having sort of about 16%. Um, and what, what does it mean when public service workers have seen real terms decline and in general society's had the poorest decade of wage growth for over 200 years? And CEOs, meanwhile, saw a 10% increase in their wages. And um, FTSE CEOs saw, um, FTSE 100 CEOs, I should say, saw a 10% increase in their in their incomes between 2015 and 2016, which is one year. You know, what does it mean, really? How can we have social mobility in that kind of society when the inequalities are so huge in terms of income? Um, and we know that that's true. Also, next slide in terms of um, regional inequalities, which in this country are huge, huge. We are one of the worst countries amongst our uh, Western neighbours um, in terms of the difference between parts of London and the rest of the UK. Um, so look, in the southeast of England, the highest median um, household total wealth is at 309,000 and you move up and you just see that just drift away to the north. I mean, what does it mean? What does, how does social mobility work in a country that is so unequal in terms of income, so unequal in terms of um, regional prosperity? I'll come back to that again in the next slide. This is something from Danny Gordon who I know has spoken. This is about land ownership. And you know this is true of housing also. Like, you know, the, the richest 1% <coughs> essentially it was split up into, into the country in terms of who owns the land. Um, I mean, look at I mean, look at that. It's so dramatic, isn't it? 50% Northern Ireland. I mean, how does climbing that, how does, what does that look like in this society? <coughs> Private schools. I mean, this is the big thing. I mean, I did some number crunching for a BBC documentary called um, Will Britain Ever Have a Black Prime Minister? And I really insisted with them that this isn't about black and white, and though there are, there are real racist, racial prejudices, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, this is about if you went to a private school, and especially the, the, those top private schools, right? So if you went to Eton and Westminster and St Paul's, and those kinds of schools, like the likelihood of you getting to those top jobs it's dramatically different. So people have put it at about 90%, like 90 times more likely to get into those sorts of things, 90 times. Um, and I find I found myself in that work that they, it was, you know, um, we talk about Oxford and Cambridge and that we were looking in that about the journey that the typical person will make to be a prime minister. And they often do go through Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and if you've gone to Eton, it's like a third of the year will go to Oxford or Cambridge, you know, out of 200. About 60 to 80 of them all go to Oxford or Cambridge University. I mean, I don't know about you, but the school I went to, there was a thousand in my, I went to further education college, and there was me that got in, you know, it's not, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's so dramatically different, um, and we still see uh, those schools and people that go to those schools dominate so many of our sectors, and in fact, some of those things are getting worse, so in fact, it's like top journalist jobs and they found in the last two years have actually become, those last three years, they've become more dominated by um, privately educated people. And, and you know, in some ways you, could, you can 
the blame the parents, but the system is such that um, yeah, if you go, if you can afford to send your kid to private school, uh, then that is going to make their lives so 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 much better. Um, and, and it's a way in which the system is gained, essentially, right? So the whole concept of social mobility is moving up, but it also means that some people have to move down. That's not going to happen in this world, because if you can afford for your child to go to a really great school, then um, they're not going to move down. They might not get the same job as you, but they are certainly going to inherit wealth, and they certainly are going to still get a pretty decent job. And um, there's some really good... I, mean, I think it's really damning, I didn't put the graph up, but um, you know, if you take, um, I think it's a bit hard to put it this way, but like a poor kid that's really smart, um, and um, a not so smart kid <laughs> that, is, uh, that is rich, by the time they've reached um, seven, um, that rich poor kid, um, that poor smart kid has fallen behind that rich, less smart kid, I don't want to say less dumb kid, but that's how someone put it. Um, but that's what it, the difference it makes, right? The first couple of years in terms of vocabulary, vocabulary um, if you're born to a rich family, and who has any control over that, right? That's just the lottery of birth. Next slide. I mean, this is really critical, so this is more on my kind of economic side. So the, the time when there was social mobility was when there were, oh, let me just explain this, take a bit of time to explain this graph. So, this is over time what's happening in the labour market. You have sort of low wage jobs and higher wage jobs and you have the jobs in the middle. And what we've seen over time is a, a big growth at this end, low wage jobs, and some growth as well at the high, high end. And, and this dramatic drop in the middle. So our labour market, what our labour market is doing is that it's really segmenting and a lot of those middle jobs are falling out. So they might be middle management, they be manufacturing, um, and, and medium level jobs as well, medium paid jobs, are falling away. So we are getting a situation whereby it's low wage, and not only is it low wage, it's not low wage with a ladder. So there's some really interesting work the Resolution Foundation's on where they found that um, about three quarters of people in low wage work 10 years ago had, were either still in the, that low wage work or had gone in and out from low wage to slightly better, to back to low wage, right? So people are stuck at that bottom end. Or, you know, if they make it, if they make it into this high end, then great, so you know, they'll, they'll be um, able to earn more money. But of course, when you think about social mobility and everyone doing well in this scenario, how does that work? Our well, labor market is not the case, it's not the case. It doesn't give room for everyone to earn a decent wage and to move up. It's just not those ladders there in our labour market in the same way that they were there when we had huge expanse of social mobility and um, you know post-war period because there was a whole bunch of jobs that were created that allowed people to move up and, and get those middle level jobs. So our labour market doesn't even apply to our concept of social mobility right now. It's not even the case that our economy can facilitate it. Um, so it's interesting to hear the way in which you know politicians talk about it in reality. So I need to quickly talk about this graph on, on racial coaches, and this is really all the ways in which I've just discovered like social mobility in our current conceptualization doesn't work. And um, this is something we I did for this BBC documentary, um, and it and it's this idea that when um, black children, black African, black Caribbean enter schools, um, and so there's the white population there as well, they come in at a certain level, and there's this dramatic shift downwards, and then there's this dramatic shift upwards between 14 and 16. And um, when we went to ask academics about how they could explain that, and they, there were some studies that they'd done, and essentially this is the time that suddenly tests are anonymized and sent outside of school. Yeah. And I, I know it's really hard to take that on. Um, but racial prejudice and class prejudice um, are steeply uh, in each one of us, probably <laughs> to some extent, you know. And that's what this is about. And I had to show this graph to a whole bunch of head teachers, and I know they found it very, very difficult. Um, and the reason I show this is, is when we hear about social mobility in the way that we have in the last 10, 15 years, 
is that it's often about um, sort of education and free internships. It never considers the way in which class and race prejudice is playing out. There's never a section in the report on what you do about social mobility about addressing prejudice. And yet we know uh, that it plays out so much in certain children's lives that they will, um, you know, that will be one of the key reasons they don't get to be socially mobile because they have been labelled from a very, very young age. You know, as part of that show, we went and spoke to parents in the nursery and the, the level of exclusion for black children, even in the nursery, even in nurseries, the small children are getting excluded. Um, and you know, it's really important that we confront this. Um, and that in every analysis that we do of social mobility, we always consider prejudice. It's something that I think that we tend to ignore. Um, and this is true of race, and in class it plays out as well. So I don't know if you've noticed in, in your own lives, but I, I've hired so many in the last few years, like hired people that then I think are probably from the southeast somewhere, but then they tell me that no, they're from Birmingham or Durham or something. Like they have no accent, and then you know I'm just like, but where is your accent gone? And they always tell me a similar story, which is when they went to university, people made fun of them and they just played it down, or they purposely tried to lose it. I mean, I'd be interested in, in if other people have had that experience. I know when I went to Oxford, <laughs> people said to me, why do you speak like you're from? EastEnders. I'm <laughs> from the East End. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it was a real, it's a real shock about how those things will play out and how we judge people. I mean, I would just, just this for an experiment in terms of like accents is um, whenever someone like Angela Rayner or Laura Pitcock, for instance, comes on Question Time, she's on, oh, she's on tonight actually, I think, Laura. Um, someone with a very strong regional accent. Just watch what happens on Twitter and the way people will speak about them. It's so striking. People saying intelligent things and yet the way they will be spoken about on Twitter because of their accent. And there was one really interesting one with Angela Rayner where, whereby she made some announcements on education policy. So she's a shadow education minister for Labour. And, and they had a, on the poli daily politics show something, had a reaction to it. And one of them was just so demeaning of her. And she'd actually just said something very smart and very coherent. And you could see how his class prejudice was play, playing out in the way that he perceived her. And so when I come to talk about solutions, I want to you know, keep, keep this in mind. Yeah, I mean, a government that talks about social mobility and then we have an incredible exponential rise in the number of people going to food banks. And you know, back in 2010, when this government came to power, um, it was, you know, food bank, food packages were hand, handed out in the tens of thousands, now it's over a million. How can we talk about social mobility when we're also, you know, doing this? And so next slide. And I should say that, um, and, and this is austerity, this has been the impact of austerity, and this is um, a really good in this International Women's Day, so again, let's make sure we do the intersectional breakdown. And, um, you know, who did it affect? It affected the poorest the most, it affected women the most, and it affected women of colour the most, or it is affecting, I should say, it's not even a past thing, this is still very much a reality of people's lives. So, um, you cannot, I mean, it's just, I'm, I get so frustrated watching, you know, Theresa May talk about a British dream and social mobility and meanwhile be doing this. Because you cannot have a situation where people are going to be able to, um, you know, suddenly become the richest um, if they are facing these day-to-day -day struggles um, where it's become so, so difficult in their own lives. Like, I spent part of my childhood and on benefits, and had my mum not had that, then, you know, that that would have been the difference in terms of, and, and sort of housing stuff. I mean, most people will say that that kind of stress that that would put on, on yourself and your children, I mean, you know, that there'll be academics in the room that would have looked at these things. It's just, it just makes it so, so much harder. Um, just one so how do we, you know, so the reality is, but when we talk about ladders, <laughs> some of these ladders are shorter, some of them are the bright ladder, 
Um, you know, there's not just one uniform ladder. Some of us are lucky enough to have a particular, you know, this red ladder that goes all the way to the top and to the next slide. And, and the reality is of social mobility right now is that some of us are bloody climbing hard, and others are just getting lifted up by, like, you know, this is part of their very existence. It's so easy. They're not really having to graft and call your kids ridiculous names so they can't forget that they have to do better life. <laughs> um, you know, and this is, this is the reality of it. And I was glad to find this image on, 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 uh, when I looked up social mobility. Um, so how do we go from this conceptualization and, and being honest about this to something that is not just some way of popping up the status quo. And that has been my real thing over the last 10, 15 years of doing this work, is that social mobility is a concept that shouldn't be a bad thing, right? We can all relate to it, but has been highly individualized and has been used to get us to ignore the structural <laughs> issues. And just thinking about some of the word associations of it um, right now, sorry to remember that one. So, you know, with her social mobility, with her aspirational, with her meritocracy, making it in life, advancement, social climbing, status, and then, you know, but what it's really come to mean to me in the way it's currently conceptualized is leave people behind. You, if you make it, great. You on your own manage to pull up your socks and do it and leave those people behind. And within that, there's some sort of shame that's built into that is this idea is that I grow up in somewhere that we should leave, that it's something to be shameful of, it's something that I want to lose my accent for and pretend I'm not from. It builds in this very idea of class hierarchy um, and the shame of being from certain places that's kind of like underlying the concepts and what we hear and the policies they put out there, that's what's in, intertwined. Um, and then it's, you know, this idea of meritocracy um, that if you do make it you can say well it's because I worked really hard it was nothing to do with the state it was nothing to do with an inspirational teacher or luck because a lot of this is luck um, you can just say it was all me and you know there's something else there's another system that works because we treat it because we are told that we should just look after ourselves and think of ourselves right this story is perfect for an economic system that wants you to just focus on yourself, on the profit, on the bottom line, not your society, not what's happening around you, um, just on yourself. This is a convenient story in the way that it's been told today. It really props up the system and the status quo as it is. And it, just this is obviously um, Grenfell, um, which, you know, at the time it happened, I, I was, I did quite a bit of media work, so I went down that day and it was still smoking and it's, I don't know, the people that had seen it in the room, it's just the most shocking, shocking thing to still see now, I still go past it maybe twice a month and I'm, you know, I'm always just sort of um, heartbroken for those people that died and it's just massive. Um, Sort of shame for us, I think, as a country. Um, but in the aftermath of that, I did quite a lot of media, and I, I was having this conversation with Ian Dale, who some of you will know, who's a very popular show on LBC, um, a conservative commentator. And he said, um, you know, this was a special type of block. Uh, there was this artist living there, the teacher. And I said, um, look, this is that and she was obviously very talented, but why do you think it was special? Don't you think that there are talented people living in council estates? And he still wanted to insist that it was special. And um, in that moment, it really struck me how much stigma there is attached to social housing um, or council housing. Um, and how much stigma there is attached to being working class or, and the way in which we've demonized certain people over the last 30, 40 years. And in particular, I think 
um, in the last 10 years around the whole kind of benefits scroungers narrative. You know, why did he think, why did we not listen to these people? And, and when you ask them themselves, they will say that they were treated with contempt, they were looked down at, that they believe themselves that class prejudice was a big part of it. It's not just putting words in their mouths. And why is it that this man found it so hard to believe that council estates are full of very talented young people? Um, and, you know, when you take this all together, you realise that social mobility um, has been a concept applied to um, certain people. Certain people are allowed to be mobile. Um, and essentially, it's really the middle class. And everyone else, if you're not doing that, is you're, you're a scrounger, you're lazy, you know, you're stigmatised. And, and if you're you know, born a certain race, then you're less likely to be even thought that you can be socially mobile just because of um, uh, where you live or the way you look. So, um, just moving on to kind of what I think we should do. I think social mobility in the term has been used in such toxic ways. I mean, perhaps the best test of this is to think about where we are today. Um, this country has uh, very low levels of social mobility compared to other high-income countries. Um, you know, if you're from, if you're born to a parent of managerial background. Um, then you're 20 times more likely to get a managerial time, job yourself than if you're working class and that's a, that's a big difference, right? And so obviously, this conversation we've had about social mobility, which has you know, been pretty intense, um, but hasn't really got us anywhere, it has only allowed um, more stigma, um, more hierarchy in society, um, and it hasn't meant that we've had this great burst of representation in various different and places, whether that be in politics or media, and it's not worked. And we can go about reframing social mobility and using it differently, but I just think the term has um, been so poisoned that the best thing is just to throw it away. I was just having a meeting with a Labour politician yesterday that's doing some work around this, and I was like, I just think we need to start a new conversation, because the idea of social mobility right now is all about one person making it and therefore everything's okay. The idea right now is as long as, um, and this happens with conversations about equality as well, as long as all groups, male, female, different races, um, are uh, equally likely to be affected by austerity, is that okay? No, I'm not fighting for that. You know, I'm fighting for the end of this area. I'm fighting for everyone to be lifted out of that um, and not. Um, so it's just this the whole concept right now is so problematic and, and really leads us down this road of being individualistic and not thinking about um, class and race and various other things. I just don't even want to talk about it anymore, which is hilarious because I constantly get asked to speak about it. Um, yeah, it's like the most popular topic I want to talk about. Um, so yeah, so let's not talk about social mobility. Let's move on. Let's move on. Get out. <laughs> so what should we do instead? And you know, to me, I'm an inequality geek, but this is this is the way to th to start thinking about it and thinking about it is that that no country with high levels of inequality. So here's higher levels of inequality. The higher levels of inequality you have, the lower levels of social mobility. Um, so this is like the livelihood of um, intergenerational earnings mobility. So, you know, down here, you know, they, they have this joke that if you want the American dream, move to like Denmark or Norway. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, let's just, let's just talk about what the underlying issue is here, which is overall income and wealth inequalities, um, and let's talk about some of the prejudices that are allowing this to happen. Um, so I just want to talk about equality. Um, I think that's probably where what we've been ignoring. Um, and, it's, and I've been in conversations with people where I say to conservative and lived and politicians where I say, why are you just focusing on, so, focusing on social mobility as some isolated concept that's not related to overall levels of inequality? Um, and they really, they don't have much of an answer to that. The only thing they'll say is that there's, oh, there's an outlier, there's a couple of outliers like Australia or whatever. <laughs> For the main part, this is just, this is, this has been established over years and there's lots of evidence to, to 
suggest this is the case. So let's not be distracted by an emotional issue of social mobility. Let's do the underlying things that will make social mobility. Moving on. So, um, and I think this was confirmed, I don't know if you guys saw like the State of the Nation report that came out at the end of last year and after, a couple of weeks after the whole Social Mobility Com Commission quit because they just fell off of um, government not listening to them. But what they found is that um, <coughs> there were kind of social mobility hotspots and cold spots. And I kind of have an issue with this anyway, but what they found was that in places where you'd expect there to be lower levels of social mobility, what made the difference, so many of them were in London, which is obviously a regionally a rich place, and there's more opportunities to do internships, there's more opportunities to have, be mentored, you know, success is kind of on your doorstep as such. Um, London and bigger cities can attract good teachers. Uh, and this was it, like, for a lot of the places where it was very, very unlikely for you to be able to, um, you know, the likelihood of you staying in education, etc. A lot of it was to do with how poor the area was more generally and how um, the infrastructure that had, even to sort of further education colleges and stuff, right? So coastal towns, places that have been long forgotten and um, that just don't have infrastructure. So this is a plan that kind of brings that all into play. Um, um, and it really reflects, so I've been working many years on what's driving overall levels of inequality. Um, so ed education, so the big thing, and this should be just a no-brainer, is that we need to do lots more in early years education and investment. And all the countries with higher levels of social mobility and higher levels uh, lower levels of inequality, economic inequality overall, just invest loads in early years, and it has all kinds of other benefits on international women's say, of course, um, you know, we do that in a way that means that women can go back to work if they, if they want to, um, and it also means, and it has to be well paid, too often we think about childcare and we forget about women working in those very jobs that are you know, paid so poorly. And the other drivers of inequality that we never think about, actually, um, is power, is deunionization, and we often hear a lot about technology, technology and globalization, but actually when you look at the studies, the big thing is that inequality grew when union power went down. And it really is about workers being able to come together and say, you're not getting that pay rise this time round, and we're gonna share it out. And, and if you don't do it, then this is what's gonna happen. And you've gotta have a bit of that, right? Like it's just about power and who has power. Um, and whether that looks like sectoral collective bargaining, which is essentially um, ways in which sort of worker reps and business reps and can come together and, and talk about how much their wages are for a particular sector, which is something they do a lot on the continent. Or if that's in individual workplaces, and that's something that needs to be discussed. But you know, unions have been so demonized over recent years um, that it feels very far away from happening, but you know, IMF, OECD, they all find the same thing in terms of drivers of overall inequality, that deunionization is, is key to it, and then yet they don't reflect that in their recommendations. And so, you know, we've got to like just stop being so mean about unions because they're just part of the solution. Um, what we do on technology and political, system, political systems, um, I'm gonna go back to this in a minute, and um, what we do on asset inflation and housing is a big part of this. I mean, uh, I was looking at some household wealth data, um, and you get the situation where a third of the population will have no housing wealth, and another third will have a bit of housing wealth once they've paid off their mortgage. And, and then you know at the top end, there are like 15 million pounds of housing, housing wealth, like 1% and um, you know, at the very upper end on average. It's, it's, a, it's really quite striking. We can't, we can't sort this out without doing something about housing. And it can be very unpopular, um, in terms of when you think about um, what you do in inheritance tax, you know, a whole bunch of the ways in which money is passed on is through housing, um, but it just it just has to be done. Um, and obviously we need to end, end the surrogate. I'm going to talk about sort of inheritance in a second. Um, so the way I was thinking about this years ago, we did this report and we tried to sort of sort out these factors in a way to understand them and make it a bit clearer. Um, so if you think about signing off in life, um, like we say, it's a lottery of birth, uh, where you're born, how much wealth you have. Um, then you go through those chances, early influences in life, 
um, where you go to school, whether you have good early years education. Um, that then pushes on through to what we, where you go to university and on to what, how the economic system is sorting people and what you're doing in the labour market, the type of job that you have, and whether you're a banker or not, um, and the ways in which that system is making some people rich over others, whether you do a job that is typically a woman's job, right? They're always underpaid. Um, and then the way in which the tax system then doesn't, tends to make all of those things worse. Um, we don't have a progressive tax system right now, um, especially when it comes to, to wealth. Um, and so how do we move from this vicious cycle that with every round it takes makes it worse and gives the next generation a whole bunch of extra money or less money and makes, um, and makes society even more unfair? Um, how do we turn that into um, a virtuous cycle? Um, and there's a number of things we can do. So. Uh, the first thing is to forget about social mobility target. Let's make an inequality target. Let's try and think about ways in which we reduce overall inequalities. Let's have tests to make sure that policies um, don't uh, exacerbate <coughs> current inequalities. Um, so, I don't know, so I often, when the budget comes out, I will be there as a proper geek looking for all of the annexes and appendixes um, and, and the way the Treasury does it right now, so they do a distributional analysis of the, the impacts of their policy, but they hide it in my annex um, And I, I have a friend of mine that works at the Treasury who I called a few years ago to try and get some like inside information on what might be in the budget. Um, and I asked him, so what, what does a distributional analysis show? So this was like maybe five days before the budget. And he was like, the what? And I was like, the distributional analysis. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, we do that right at the end. They had like no, like absolutely zero, zero influence on what the government was going to decide to do. Like it just goes to show how little they care. Um, these things can, like these things can be tech and um, like tick box exercises, but we have to um, make sure that the policies that we are putting in place, and those aren't just in education, by the way, they are across the board, are not going to exacerbate inequalities, and in fact, are going to lower overall economic. So they, they did that distributional analysis and it showed it was regressive, but they did it at the end and they didn't care. Um, and so they could have, you know, if they wanted to really make sure that it was um, you know, on its shoulders, taking the biggest burden, then they would have changed their policies and did that test again and made sure that it... So some of these things are really techy and not sexy, but they're the sorts of things that you just have to inbuild into policy. We've got a long way to go to turn this around. And so we have to be doing this checklist against everything that we decide to do. And um, childcare, like I said, I just think that's a no-brainer, and by like, any politician that is going to push that along is going to get a whole bunch of votes from every party I go to. I don't know, my friends who think I have more political influence than I do, the first thing I always come to complain to me about is the cost of childcare. Uh, so yeah, I think that's just a total no-brainer for anyone. Um, wages and working conditions. Um, like I say, we just have to turn the story around in terms of unions. That's not to say that unions are perfect or they behave perfectly, but they are democratic organisations. We need to join them, we need to remake them, and we need to make sure that we have a say on these issues. Our day-to-day -day working lives are so important. Um, what you do then on investment across the country and a good job strategy, an industrial strategy that creates good jobs, um, in all of these places that have been ignored outside London and the South East, how we stop doing this ridiculous thing of having, um, you know, uh, rail infrastructure, after rail infrastructure investment just in the London area to the rest of the country. Um, you know, one of the things I would love to do as part of this is to move Parliament out to Birmingham or Manchester or somewhere else, just so they just don't get stuck in this London bubble. And I'm a Londoner. And, uh, but it, I mean, look, I'm willing to give up some of, the, some of the privilege of that because it's just, it's just so bad. And, you know, and the way in which that results in animosity, I did this speech last year in Liverpool at an economics conference, and, and it was more of a Labour Party thing, so there was a lot of kind of lay people there. And um, the two people that spoke before me were from Liverpool, and, uh, you know, they got lots of applause for being from Liverpool and talking about their socialist values coming from the north. And I was like, oh no, what are they going to say? <laughs> and I, I spoke a bit about my socialist values coming from East London. But 
um, <laughs> when I was coming out, some guy said, I really like that girl, that girl but um, I hope London ends up in a pile of S-H-I-T, you know, <laughs> and like they've been the animosity of like the sense of like it's so unfair, I mean they're right to think it's so unfair, the regional inequalities and who get, who's cared about, that has to completely change and, and that needs to come from a strategy of investment, we have to move away from this idea that state and is a bad thing or public debt is a bad thing, public debt is very, very natural and, and we have to do that big works program and what an important time to be doing it, right, because it's not just in terms of Brexit and what that means for our economy, but climate change, demographic change, technological change. Like, what an important time for us to be investing. People talk about uh, young people being saddled with debt. Young people are going to be really pissed off with us if we don't make those investments now. We don't make sure that this country is ready for all of those massive challenges that have sides. Um, and tax. And we're hoping to do sort of a big tax commission because I just feel like it's somewhere where we kind of have to start from scratch a bit. Um, some of our income taxes, sure, you can say are progressive, but for the large part, like the fact that we don't do stuff on land value tax, wealth overall, um, you know, that our conceptualizations of inheritance tax, you know, which is a very, very unpopular tax, what we can do there. But there's no way we can turn this around without doing something about inheritance tax, given the levels of wealth inequality. And wealth inequality is much, 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 much worse than income inequality, right? So, you know, there's some big hard things we have to do to make that vicious cycle a virtuous cycle. Um, and then just coming about coming to the narrative stuff, um, you know, I think in a sense we have a lot of the policy ideas, people like me that have been working on these things. And since the financial crash, there's a whole bunch of people that have been doing, doing really interesting things. But the problem is, is that we don't really have the story to go with it right now. Um, and I think, and this is just some thoughts that I'm throwing out, and I'd be really interested in what you guys think. I'm not like a frameworks and um, a framing specialist or a narrative specialist. Um, but the thing that I've started to do lately is to try and think, like I say, talk less about social mobility and talk much more about inequality and tackling economic inequality and um, to start thinking about how much and how often we can use us and we I don't want to leave it to chance I think you know should we be talking about I don't want to leave it to chance that one person gets out I want everyone to be treated with dignity I don't want it to be embarrassing and um, to be from certain parts of the country that happen to be hidden and that whole community should need to be lifted it's not about one person escaping um, and how we build a new language of that. And, and, and of course, you know, and this is true of, true of all of us that have been socially mobile, is that um, it, that, that, was always, that was always a matter of luck and always a matter of the whole village raising me and, and the number of people around that, that will you know, play a part in people's lives. And that's just true of everyone. And anytime everyone, anyone tries to tell you that it's anything else, just ask them to talk about their childhood. And it really won't take them long to mention, you know, a state school or someone that inspired them. And when you talk about where that came from, it's either luck or it's the state. Um, very often. But I'd be really interested in what you think and the ways in which we can talk about this. Because I guess the thing that's frustrated me most over recent years is that we know that a lot of these narrat a lot of what they're saying is wrong and not achievable given our current economic system. You know, even things like austerity, which is one of the biggest lies ever told to this country in terms of the economic set, was a purely an ideological move. The way in which you cut public debt is you focus on welfare jobs, you, you know, increase tax, tax take through that. And, and, you know, how have they managed to get away with all of these things? And it isn't often the lack of, sort of smart people, the stats that shows the evidence, that the, the opposite. It's because we just don't have a good story. So, um, <coughs> any story tellers in this room 